to our second installment of the webinar that we're producing. I've got some great people helping me out today. We've, we're visiting with Dr. Anna Baranowski, uh, founder and CEO of the Traumatology Institute. And Anna's, Dr. Anna is going to give us her perspective on trauma, PTSD, and from a clinical perspective, give us, give us some pointers as to which steps we might be able to take to find our way through this to post-traumatic growth and recovery. Welcome, Anna. Hi, Darren. I'm so glad to be speaking with you today. It's uh, really a pleasure. I know that you have been doing such great work trying to raise awareness about um, the issues around trauma and recovery, and you know how difficult those things can be. Uh, absolutely. It's uh, something that I think we need, we need to hear a clinical perspective on. I think uh, people in the field that I worked in as a first responder are frightened of trauma. We're frightened to give up our jobs. And um, could you, my own experience that there were a lot of opportunities that I could have done something differently. There, were, there was a point where I knew I needed to change something. But I never took those opportunities in hand. You know what? I love that you're saying that. Just that you, you, you had an awareness that there were points in your career where you, you needed to make some changes. Um, and I'm wondering, actually, if, if it was really clear to you what opportunities would help or, you know, what routes you might take. Like, we're, I think in your career, we're talking 20 years back, and those kinds of services were not uh, really all that readily available. Uh, I, I wonder what was that like for you? There were no, there were no real, uh, nothing clinical in response to what I was going through. So you're left with a feeling of weakness, and you're left feeling like, man, I can't handle this, and everybody else seems to be able to handle it. So we resist even reaching out for therapy. Practice because I work with a lot of um, emergency responders, um, whether they're police officers, uh, firefighters, paramedics, uh, or military members, or ex-military um, veterans. I, I hear this story a lot. I feel that there's this piece where there's an expectation you have to be a certain way. You have to uh, handle your pain and your suffering in a certain way. And in a lot of ways, the, the, the methods that are suggested have a lot to do with denial um, and pretending that somehow the pain isn't there. And what ends up happening is it, it creates this layering effect where you have a huge injury and then you have one layer on top of that and another and one event and then another and nothing gets dealt with. So then you'll turn to things that help you numb out so that you don't have to feel the pain and the agony of all of that. And the problem is, is that if there's so many layers, you peel back one layer only to feel the wound. Or if you turn to addictions or you, you turn to activities that numb you out, uh, like you know, eating a lot of food or just sitting around watching TV, not doing anything, not engaging with the world around you, then when you start to pull away the veil and allow yourself to be present in your life, you feel this enormous pain or you start feeling uh, or you remember something that was very upsetting to you and so you think you're trying to do good, change your life, come back out, you know, uh, pull back some of the, the, um, the, the things that keep you from feeling your life, only to feel a tremendous amount of pain. And so you have to learn how to sit in, an, in the ever-present moment with your feelings and have a way of navigating the inner discomfort. And I call that the stabilization phase of trauma recovery. Now the work that I do, trauma practice, in terms of dealing with uh, helping uh, trauma survivors, um, the trauma practice is a three-phase model. And it is a CBT approach. And we know there's a lot of research on the CBT approaches, but we're just currently in the process of doing some research with York University in um, Toronto. Ontario looking at this triphasic trauma practice approach. Stabilization, 
working through, through trauma memories. Um, and there's a lot of different approaches we use for that. And then reconnection, reconnection with all the things that were meaningful for you or could be meaningful for you in creating a steady and solid and meaningful life today. So those three phases are trauma practice. And I think the big piece that is missing for a lot of um, emergency responder community is just saying, wow, that really hurt that really was a terrible thing to encounter in the course of my work. I need to sit with that discomfort in a present way, honor it, respect it, work it through, not just cover it over because I don't want to feel the discomfort of it. And that, that, that is that key. One thing that we talk about among ourselves, uh, trauma survivors from first responder work, is we feel that if we'd been given the tools, like you just suggested, uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction, for instance, if we were delivered that in our training and had that to turn to, rather than drugs or alcohol or whatever else that we might use to numb out, uh, do, you, do you agree that education prior to employment about trauma, the prospect of trauma and what to do in the event of trauma would somewhat help to prevent full-blown PTSD from getting taking root? Well, you know what? <laughs> this is a twofold answer. Um, first of all, I'm a big um, I'm I'm a big proponent of education. I think it is absolutely um, essential. However, I think that if the trauma is big enough um, or it's constant, on on and unending, and there's no work on working through it, I think, you know, you can still develop PTSD, and that is not, that doesn't mean that the worker is not a good worker or a good person or strong enough. It, it just simply means that, you know, with these stress responses, after a while, your nervous system gets so depleted, it can't take the pounding over a long period of time. And the the reality is that being okay, doing really, really tough work, facing trauma year after year after year means that you, you, the tra the, the emergency responder, you must do your daily work on stabilization whether it's mindfulness-based stress reduction or yoga or running or just meditating or finding ways to sit in the ever-present moment and settle yourself down in a deep and meaningful way so that the next pounding doesn't feel like you are again and again um, re-injuring those wounds that already exist, but that you, you heal and recover, you stabilize, and then you move forward. Hey, that's great to know. And you, you just used the word injury. Yeah. It is an injury. Oh, yes. It's a real, real injury. And, uh, you know, I know that you've actually done uh, a lot of work in raising awareness about that, um, in raising awareness both politically and with uh, insurance companies, WSIB, I believe, specifically. Um, and that's huge and very important work because, you know, unless the insurance companies know that this is real, the workers don't get supported in the way that they need. And, you know, of course, you needed to be supported early on and given the right direction. Yeah, I always looked at, when I looked at the triphasic model when I did the community workplace traumatology course through Traumatology Institute. Yes, you did that and, and you completed your uh, certificate. And um, what did you learn? Well, what I something, and I had to personalize it somewhat. The safety and stabilization portion, in particular, is something that was totally lacking in my case, and I and I know far too many other cases. And part of that safety and stabilization, I have to say, is is financial uh, income stream. If you can't if you can't support your family and you can't work and you need to take time away to recover, interfering with with that part of human life with battling for benefits and all the rest of it. For me, I have to say it was additional trauma on top of the of the, the actual bad calls that I attended. So I, means, I actually, I absolutely agree. I would call that the second wound. 
it's like, you know, you had the right to be supported as an injured worker. And not being supported becomes an additional burden that you never should have had to carry. And I'm so sorry you did. And I hear it from so many workers that, you know, these injuries are not attended to quickly enough and addressed quickly enough so that the right tools can be put in place. And, you know, I don't know what might have happened for you, Darren, but I have to say that I've worked with um, all sorts of um, individuals and seen that they've been able to go from injured, uh, work through, to stabilization, maybe they go back to the old job, maybe they go to a new one, but they feel more um, integrated and able to get on with their life in a meaningful way. Yeah, that and that that again, that's that's part of the that's part of the progression through the triphasic model. So safety and stabilization. Let's talk. We'll talk we talked about the financial stream. Uh, the other issue at that you know at that juncture of my my collapse, I, I completely collapsed in 2005. So my family's now taken, you know, uh, has had 15 years of struggle along with me. So the entire net, the, the, the social supports and primary supports and family were destroyed as well. And we often talk among ourselves again in the survivor community that family is our most intimate space. They're going to see changes in us before anybody else will. You might be able to cover it up in the community or on the on the job still, but at home, not so not so much. And I think that's where we let loose and, and we cause more harm than good. Educating family too. Would you agree that that's something for first responder families and specifically? Well, it certainly does help because what ends up happening is those uh, you know those symptoms that you know what they're like like they, they're very confusing they're complicated they they have many layers to them you know the the intrusive thoughts the nightmares the fearful feelings the agitation the the um, difficulty um, managing startle response um, you know uh, you you start to go um, to places in your mind um, where you think in negative ways that you never believed before, you become a different person. And so, when the family understands where this come where this is coming from, and they can be compassionate witnesses mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to what you've you're experiencing, mm -hmm. and you can be a compassionate witness to what your family is experiencing that support becomes much more integrated. It's Yeah, and that's that was something that was missing too. I mm -hmm. think that there's been improvement and I'm, I'm happy to see that things have changed. In some ways it's getting easier for people to get help, but there's still this culture within the services themselves that to admit to a mental health struggle is, uh, it's it still remains somewhat unacceptable. So we avoid seeking help because our peer group will ostracize us, and that happens all the time. So um, again, the culture within the services needs to, to change, and we see this as needing to be a top-down delivery of, of shit. In oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, sure, certainly because what, what ends up happening is as soon as people who are in the upper layer is saying, you know, hey, you know, this is a real issue, we know it happens, what can we do, we want to support you through it, um, there's an understanding and then when you feel that, you know, kind of that soul wounding like you talked about um, when we spoke previously, um, you can say, it's time for me to do something to take care of this injury and it's like a broken arm you're just not going to go to work the day that you break your arm you're going to go to the hospital you're going to get a cast you might need some time away from work to to deal with it well the 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 injury that you've experienced the PTSD needs to be tended to and it should be the earlier it's tended to the better the outcome in the long run because then you start to learn Oh, what does my body feel like when it's gone to the point where it's so stressed that this this is not going to this is going to undermine this is going to chip away at me uh, over the course of my career I can't carry this burden for a lifetime you know and instead you address that in the early stages you put uh, an infrastructure around it so that you have the tools that you need 
to either keep going forward in the chosen career or choose something that will be a better fit for you early enough mm. that um, y your life doesn't have to fall apart. Yeah, it's, it would feel more like a choice at that point rather than a law. Yes. Yeah. So in safety, safety and stabilization, do you, do you, is that where emotional self-regulation is taught? Yes, yes, yes. And, but not only there, right? Not only there, but when you do some of the deeper working through exercises, and let's, let's move into that, but when you, work, yeah. when you work on the deeper working through exercises with some of the exercises that we use, like layering or uh, thematic map and release, um, these exercises actually help you stay in the ever-present moment, self-soothing, while you're facing the trauma memory process, the trauma memories, those those earlier events or those previous events uh, that have a current day ignition. So if you can learn how to sit with calm and comfort to stabilize while you are recalling the trauma memories, mm -hmm. that is a game changer. It's life changing. You know that because I know you told me that you did uh, EMDR and we talked about that in a previous video. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there was EMDR, trauma release exercise, and um, self-regulation therapy kind of in combination with uh, three different therapists, mind you, but still it was that those three things together along with the, the, the workplace traumatology education for sure that filled in the gaps about what I was missing so that, that was it. And so for, for trauma memory processing, that's going to be painful. There's no question. And that in concert with a trauma-informed therapist, would you agree that's the place that that's done with most effect? You know what? I have to tell you that uh, I think people do need trauma-informed care. Um, it, it is something that allows for the space to work on, on trauma. It, with with somebody who kind of really gets it and and that just allows a lot of safety that creates a kind of holding space for um, for you or, or for anybody who's working through these issues to to make sense of what happened and to um, have the support that they need you know for all those symptoms for all the complications for all the layers of it but you know what I, I actually also believe that we need to throw everything at it so for some people um, what could end up happening is because your nervous system is so depleted, you actually need help with, um, you know, the right supplements like a B complex or you need to, you know, see a naturopath or, you know, have somebody help you with, you know, what you're eating or start exercising because we are complex human beings. So, yes, absolutely go for therapy, but also do all the things you know you need to do to be well on all levels and layers as a human being including making sure that you have proper financial support. Right, so it's a biopsychosocial approach that you recommend. Right, exactly, the biopsychosocial approach, and you know that because you've done training with me. So yes, the biopsychosocial approach, you throw everything at it and make sure that you're paying attention to yourself as a whole and integrated human being. And definitely psychotherapy, that piece of it can, can make a huge difference. And it's through that recovery process with that kind of model in play that people are granted the best opportunity for a positive outcome that leads towards post-traumatic growth. Would you agree with that? I hope so. I've seen a lot of that. And I find that the people that recover the best are the ones that practice daily and make an effort to really pay attention to those choice points that we all have, those moments in life where we just know that we need to pay attention. Yeah. And I really just, you know, I want to just encourage you and, and everybody out there that when you reach those choice points and your body, your mind, your, your soul is screaming at you, stop, pay attention, that you do that. And then yeah. you just let yourself be open to the help that is available because, you know, when you start to become aware that you need something and you become open to the fact that you are deserving of this, mm -hmm. there are people all around you all the time who are willing. Mm -hmm. For sure. And, and it seems that once the once that door opens, then the, there's more doors that open along the way. You might You've seen that. Yes, I have. 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I have. And then the outcome, uh, I mean, there's lots of losses that went along with my case, and there's lots of losses that go along with, with a lot of cases that don't get help in time. But I think if we could smooth that, if we could smooth that ride out for, for folks in first responder work to just say, hey, you know, this happens, it can be expected, and let's handle it in a more appropriate kind of streamlined, step-by-step -step way. I, I think we'd see far less families destroyed. I, I, I just have that gut feeling that it would just be such an incredible outcome. Yeah, we, we really can't afford to lose one more hero. Yeah, I, I agree with you. The other thing that stood out for some, uh, I, I interviewed a, a police officer recently, and the work-life balance aspect of our work. We tend to join up and hang out with first responders. We do everything together. We become somewhat workaholics. We get tied into our communities in a way that we don't disconnect from to even recover from a, a run of shifts, you know. And that's the other thing that I think uh, work work life balance. You agree? Oh There's, yeah, yeah. We we are that. not just our jobs. That's for sure. And we do need to find ways to play and to make light of our lives and to enjoy humor and art and just engage in the world around us. Be in nature. Do the things that you know settle you down and give you a deep feeling of being restored. Yes, exactly. Thank you so much. Uh, can you fill us in a little bit on the work of the Traumatology Institute? So the Traumatology Institute has been around since about 1999. I'm the CEO and the founder. And we've been offering courses since 1999. Um, I've been training since about 1997. And we have a community and workplace uh, traumatologist training program, which is for people who work uh, in the community. It might be emergency responders or nurses. Um, it might be somebody working at a community center that need the skills to become a trauma-informed care provider because you're going to be working with trauma survivors all the time. This is a great course. Another uh, series that we offer is our clinical traumatologist training. And I know you had said that there aren't enough um, um, trained trauma-informed care uh, therapists. Uh, the clinical traumatologist is for those people. That's a course for people who really want to know uh, how to help trauma survivors. It's much more in depth. It's only for people who have a mental health background um, and have um, the registration uh, to, to complete that, that program. But it is filled with resources that create a rich response from intake through to uh, stabilization, working through trauma, and um, also self-care for, the, um, for the therapist as well. Uh, and that's really a mental health program um, for people who want those deep, deeper skills. Now, the other um, program that we offer is a compassion fatigue program, which is a really important one for people who either recognize themselves, they've become overwhelmed because of their work, or they want to help people who have become overwhelmed in the course of helping trauma survivors. Um, we have a lot more courses, but we also have our trauma recovery program online, which is at What is PTSD? And um, it's an online program for people who want you know, to start somewhere, a self-guided approach, as well as our what is PTSD YouTube channel, and that's a completely free resource. Um, it's just our way of giving back to community. There's definitely over a hundred videos there, and um, if people are interested in subscribing to the to the channel, then you'll get those um, weekly releases because we're releasing videos every single week, and there's loads of content and probably something for uh, everybody who's experienced stress or trauma. Oh, super! Thanks, and I'm uh, just to let viewers know. All these links will be available on, on the web page where you're watching this video. Just look at the bottom. It will be accessed directly from this page to Dr. Baranowski's work and the Traumatology Institute. Um, I want to thank you for spending this time with us. It's really my pleasure, Darren. I'm so glad um, to know about your story and also to, you know, get a chance to, to talk 
with you and you know hear about your journey as well so thank you so much and um, please stay on your path I will and thank you and uh, like we'll point we'll point people in that direction I just one more question about the trauma treatment online program and the compassion fatigue uh, education that's available online um, we, we tend to look at those courses and we think we need to either be in trouble already or that it's not specific to first responders or whatever. My experience with all with the Community Workplace Traumatology Program, for instance, the education that it provided me uh, post-trauma, mind you, but if, I had, if I'd have had that uh, prior to being injured and could have had that information, the knowledge that is shared through that program is just so vast and so it's brilliant. I, and it was uh -huh. crazy through the Moodle program. Oh, yes. So, uh, Thank you so much. Yes, there's a lot of work that goes into it. And I have a staff that's working very hard on creating programs uh, with me um, to ensure that the quality is good and it's easy to follow. And, um, it, and as you know, it's just filled with resources, all of that material. And, of course, the trauma recovery program, as you had suggested, no, I think that, you know, at the early onset, if you're feeling that, you know, you've experienced a trauma and you don't understand what's happened to you, it's actually a really good program to take. And um, we have people trying it out all over the place. Um, and even just the 30-day stabilization program, um, the video stabilization program, we have people who do that two, three, four times in a row because it helps to stabilize them. And, you know, it's... Um, it's an opportunity for them to really integrate the work that we do um, even before because a lot of people you know they they can't get in to see a therapist really quickly so it's a really good before you manage to get in to see your therapist yeah and, it, and it's a good um, I'm, I'm, I'm too shy or I'm too uptight to go to a therapist it's a good it's a place to you can do it at home and and to be honest with you as well the the cost is incredible <laughs> it's inexpensive and it, the, the information that came back from that program, I just wanted to, the, uh, it's a personal thank you to Traumatology Institute for providing that. Oh, you're, you're so welcome. Yeah, it is, it's not a very steep price. It certainly is less than one therapy session oh. for most people. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Thanks again. And thank you well. so much, Darren. Be right. well and um, stay on your path. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Be well and um, stay on your path. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.